Hello, welcome. Come on in, everybody. This webinar is our product experts series. It's a series of webinars that we run, and we always have these talks recorded, as somebody asked. The past talks are always recorded, and it's a mix of presentations and firesides. So today is going to be a fireside conversation. And it's always from a mix of different experts, amazing experts from around the world that we bring in. We bring their insights and their experiences and share them with us. And it's always with a focus on the content and the learning and the sharing. So you're all going to get a lot out of this. And as I said, today is going to be recorded and shared and you will have a chance to ask questions. So do take advantage of that. A little tiny bit about ProdPad before we get started. For those of you who haven't had a chance to try it out, I do recommend jumping in and giving it a go. It's free to try. It's a tool that was originally built by myself and my Mind the Product co-founder, Simon Gast. We were both product managers ourselves and we needed tools to do our own jobs. These tools didn't exist. So we needed something that was going to help us keep track of the experiments we were running, things that we were trying to track to hit the business objectives and to solve our customer problems, and just keep tabs on all the different ideas and feedback and everything that made up our backlog. And so building ProdPad gave us transparency, it gave us organization, it gave us control. Uh, and it wasn't long before we started sharing it with the other product people around us. And today it's used by thousands of product teams around the world. So. It's free to try, and we even have a sandbox mode, which is filled with example product management data. So you can see how lean roadmaps, OKRs, experiments, and everything else all fits together in a product management space. And our team is made up of product people. It was founded by product people. We've got product people throughout the team. So I'd love if you all try, start a trial and give it a go, and then get in touch and give us feedback. We'd love to hear it. And on that note, I want to introduce you formally to Ben Foster. So Ben is our special guest for the day. He's one of our product experts. And how do I know Ben? So as you know, I'm one of the founders of Mind the Product and at the big product conference that we ran earlier this year, Ben was one of the speakers and I loved what he was sharing and I wanted to learn more from him. So reached out to get this chat going. Ben has more than 20 years of product management experience. He's chief product officer at Whoop and was formerly a senior product manager at eBay, VP of product at Opower and uh, CPO at GoCanvas. And he's also the co-author of a book called Build What Matters. It's a book that outlines a, a smart framework for becoming a product-driven company. So definitely worth checking that out. Ben, tell us about your background. I mean, how did you get into product and all of Always uh, appreciate that question. For people who have been in product for a long time, usually we have some interesting stories for how we've done it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before jumping in, just let me say thanks for uh, for hosting me on this. It's really great to be here. Uh, great to be uh, to be interviewed on this, and I really appreciate the opportunity to to get a chat chat, yeah. chat, chat with everybody on the on the webinar here. But yeah, real quick, my my story is an interesting one. I was fortunate enough. This is kind of an interesting one. Looking back, to have been hired at the very beginning of my career in product by Marty Kagan, and so I joined his team back in this is 2001 when he was the head of product at eBay. Prior to that, I had done some work uh, in QA for a company, but I didn't know that's really what I wanted to do or anything like that. I, I had majored in statistics, and there was a company that was just based in the same city where I graduated back in Berkeley, and they were a financial analytics company, kind of doing portfolio analysis for Wall Street investor types. And uh, we had acquired this other company that had this half functional piece of software, and they wanted me to do some testing on it while the phones weren't ringing for support matters that I was intended to actually like try to address. And so I accidentally found myself getting involved in, in software. I did, hadn't really joined with that purpose in mind. This is back in 1998. And just then the whole internet boom was really just taking off. And I was in the right place at the right time and really got some amazing experience and Turned that into a, a career that really got jump started at eBay over on Marty's team. Feel like I really got to learn the basics and the fundamentals of product management. I really had to do it right 10 years before a lot of people had even learned about the existence of the role. And so I was able to carry that forward. And I just kind of feel like I've just been uh, the beneficiary of having a lot of experience along the way and hopefully helping the next kind of company that I work with to help see around corners and understand how to think about product in a new and novel yeah, amazing. Talk about getting an amazing head start, getting to work directly with Marty Kagan. And great to have you here sharing your your story and uh, your experience about all of this. I want to hear a little bit about this book that you've written, Build What Matters. What compelled you to write the book? I mean, who is it for and what problem does it solve? Yeah, great question. I I, I co-wrote the, the book with another guy, Rajesh Nurlikar. And Looking back at my career, I was in operational roles through VP of product and things like that until we took Opower public. And at that time, I decided to leave 
Because I really wanted to get back to the startup world and living in Arlington, Virginia, there weren't as many sort of like product focused companies, plenty of technology companies, but not as many that were like really product oriented the way you might find in Silicon Valley, et cetera. And so I started doing a lot of advising work, helping those companies to think in that more product oriented way. They had to think about the, the founding of a product team at those companies. And so I played that role over and over and I started to realize that I was telling the same stories time and time again, that I was kind of having to illustrate the same kinds of like points time and time again. And what's really interesting is I kind of got into advising because I, I wanted to share a lot of the things that I had learned and a lot of ways teach. And what I really found in the experience was that I was learning so much, both from my interactions with them, but also just kind of like codifying what you start saying and saying, wow, that actually kind of does turn into a cohesive kind of like strategy or cohesive mechanism for how you think about product vision, product strategy, the direction that a company should be going, et cetera. And so as I started to piece more and more of this together and worked with Rajesh on this uh, through that advisory practice, Prodify, that we had co-founded, we realized that it would be great to share a lot of those learnings, not just with the companies that we get a chance to advise, but like a broader arena of product folks as well, whether those are product leaders or all the way down to individual contributors and product management. And so we decided to put it all together in a book and share all the kinds of things that we had picked up and, and hopefully just have a really positive impact on the product community overall. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to have this stuff uh, shared out. It's, it's a great book. I've seen people talking about it and uh, seen some really good things coming out of it. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. The You talk about in the uh, the book, I think this uh, comes up in the, the first chapter, you talk about the 10 dysfunctions of product management. And I recognize some of them instantly. You talk about the feature factory, which I think a lot of product people know this one, when teams just constantly ship feature after feature. And you also named one, the hamster wheel, which is that focus on output over outcomes, which of course is another trap that a lot of teams fall into. What are some of the others and how do they impact teams as they try to scale? Yeah, there's a couple others that I might point uh, point out here. There's 10 of them, so I could probably go through eight more, but it's not <laughs> all of them, I think. Hopefully we'll talk more about what, what things are working within product. But one of the ones that, that I see come up a lot is, is like the roller coaster. And the roller coaster is where you kind of take all these fast turns and pivots and things like that only to end up back where you started at, at the very beginning again, much like a roller coaster would be. And I think that the reason that happens is it's almost like going too far with this agile mentality of we're going to test everything, we're going to pivot, we're going to base on what we learned, we're going to tweak this and, and change that. And at the end of the day, though, because you're trying to focus on things that are so measurable in such a short amount of time, that the reality is it constrains you to thinking in very small ways about what would happen if we move this button from the top of the screen to the middle of the screen? What would happen if we made it red instead of blue? And at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself the question, are you actually delivering any more true customer value? Or are you just trying to extract value for your own business from the customer value that you already created? And that's a really fundamental difference between like innovation versus iteration or, or you know, even operation. And I think that we try to disambiguate those different kinds of concepts within the book, because ideally you've got a roadmap that really covers all three of those, but doesn't overemphasize one over the other. And I kind of feel like the pendulum has swung in a generally a good direction in product, but it's kind of overswung in that direction of being like extremely scientific. And as a result, where's the art that kind of goes along with the science of product management and the kind of like willingness to make some large scale bets on the behalf of your customers to deliver something that's really, that's one that I would focus attention on. And then I think another one that's, that's really interesting is, oh, geez, which one do I want to pick? I'll go with, uh, with the throne room, which is number 10. And this is an interesting one as well, which is, I think that a lot of companies suffer from that issue of the hippo, the highest paid person in the room. It's really their opinion at the end of the day that ends up driving decisions. And there's an interesting issue there, which is that I think that happens when leadership is really looking for vision from within the team. And sometimes there's this disconnect that takes place between leaders of teams and the product management organization, where each one is kind of like looking for the other to paint a picture of what that vision is for where the product should be going. And so as a founder or a CEO, when you don't see that vision coming from within your own product team, you're forced into this position of saying, well, what are we actually delivering? What are we actually going to go create? And so they take it upon themselves to define what that's going to be. The problem sometimes if that goes awry is where they say, hey, wait, I'm not seeing enough progress on this other thing, or I'm not seeing enough progress over here. And so they ended up like kind of swinging pretty wildly the kinds of, you know, things that the team ends up being, ends up working on, such that there's not really enough time to deliver the, the sorts of things that you want to. And I've seen that kind of like thing take hold in a number of places in the organization. But what's interesting is all of these dysfunctions, I could rattle off all the other ones as well, but all these dysfunctions are really the same problem manifested in different ways. And that problem is 
a lack of clarity of the vision and the strategy for where you're headed with product. And that void is what gets filled in by other people stepping in, whether that's stakeholders, CEOs, people authoring spreadsheets, et cetera, versus like really having something that's very clearly defined and something that's really inspiring and exciting for people to rally around. And the more of that that you can create, the more, if you will, offense that you can play the less defense as a product manager you're forced into having to play. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I like those two picks because there are almost uh, two sides of the same coin. One is about lacking that uh, strategy, right? That longer term series of steps that the, this, the, the team should be taking. And so they end up just iterating on whatever sort of comes next, whatever floats up to the top. And it feels like good work. It feels busy, but it's actually not providing anything towards the the bigger picture of the business. And uh, as you said, the other one is uh, the lacking of the vision where the teams are looking to each other to provide that vision and they, they don't have it. So that's actually a really good point. I mean, what are some other symptoms of a team? Like, how do you tell if a team is lacking vision and uh, strategy? Yeah, I think that a lot of times companies will say, oh, you know, we've got a vision you laid out. And what they'll point to is they'll point to their mission statement and they'll say that they'll kind of declare that's their vision. And I think half the problem here is actually just one of definitions where people use these words interchangeably, mission, vision, and strategy. And the reality is they're completely different things. And so let me try to clarify for everybody, I think what the fundamental differences are between these three. And once you have that, then you can say, Ooh, we, we have this thing, but we don't have that thing. And I've seen a variety of, of companies where they have one, but not the other two. Um, so a mission is that sort of like very short, pithy statement about why are you in business in the first place and beyond making money. And I think that making money is ideally the side effect of having successfully delivered customer value, right? That's kind of what business is all about. If you wanted to make money, just go rip people off. Hey, you can go make money. But if you want to do it by building a product, the question is what product are you building to solve what problem that exists out there for whom? And at the end of the day, that's like this thing that you can always come back to. So when you get into debates as an executive team, et cetera, about whether you should work on this or work on that, sometimes it's really helpful to kind of like, remember what the mission is, or the mission is the kind of thing that's going to get you out of bed in the morning because you're so excited to work on the kind of thing that you're working on. And you get this sort of like sense of fulfillment for having solved the problem that at the end of the day really matters to people. So I think that's the kind of the mission and everything kind of like starts from that. Now derived from that though, is a vision and a product of vision is something that's very different from that because a vision is something that paints like a much clearer story, a much clearer picture about what success will look like once you get there. Okay. It's kind of like drawing on a map where the end of the rainbow is. And I kind of like use that analogy because the reality is you're never actually going to get there because all, as you make strides to get there, you're going to keep moving the goalposts for yourself. You're going to keep saying, Hey, actually now we're going to expand our, our vision and it's going to be something new, something even broader, et cetera. But the key to a really good vision is, is the following. I think it has to be really be grounded in, in the customer experience, in the customer journey that you're going to go create. And the way that I think about it is. There's a, you have to express how their lives are going to be benefited in some specific way that your product addresses with a 10 X better outcome than what they're getting today. You should be able to be bold about what your vision is about. And in order to be that kind of like bold, you have to be long-term. You can't say, yeah, we've got a vision. It declares what we're going to do in the next three months. That's not a vision. I'm sorry. You just, you're not going to be thinking broadly enough if it's in three months, it should be more like three years. And that's okay. Even if you're at a startup and you only have six months of runway left in terms of capital. Still, you should have a vision that's three years out. That comes back to the last part, which is really strategy, which is how are you going to go arrive at that vision, given some of the realities of the business world that you're surrounded by. So I think you know, just kind of coming back to what makes a, a successful vision would be and it's customer focused, it's grounded in what their experience is going to be. I've seen situations in my consulting practice where I would talk to a new company, the CEO would be really excited to go to the whiteboard and they'd say, our vision is that we're going to disrupt this industry with AI or our vision is that we're going to have $300 million of revenue. And I'm like, the one word that's missing in your whole pitch here is customer. What are you doing for them? And at the end of the day, that's the foundation of any kind of a uh, product vision. And then you describe after that, how that's going to derive benefit for you as a business as well. You obviously got to be able to do it where the economics makes sense and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's really the customer uh, focus that's going to be inspirational. And ideally that vision is something that you can use, not just to attract investors and things like that, but to attract employees as well. And that's what's going to make them excited to, to continue to work there. So that's the purpose of the vision. And I think that what it, what it allows you to do is to ask yourself as you're designing something, let's say one way versus another, you can say, or you're making a, a scoping decision for a product. Is this something that is accruing towards the vision 
or is this something that's like a distraction from, or even a backward step in the realization of our vision? And I think a lot of times it really helps with making some of those really hard decisions about where you should be going is to kind of come back to that vision at the end of the day. But the real value of a vision is to then subsequently create a strategy. And I think of a vision like planting a flag at point B, where you're standing at point A today. Okay. And so your strategy is the path that you intend to take to get from point A to point B. It's kind of like, you know, plugging it into Google Maps and saying, okay, what's the general kind of like path that you're going to take? Now, Google Maps will be very specific. So you're going to turn left at exactly the intersection, and then you're going to turn right over here, et cetera. But it's more about the concept of generally speaking, where do you need to go? Are you going to take the freeway to get there? Are you going to take something, something else? And a strategy is like laying that out. And I've found that the best way of crafting a really good strategy in order to make sure that you don't paint yourself into a corner where you're like, well, we're going to do this next and then this next and then this next. And wait, that's actually not going to help us to realize this vision. I still don't really know how we're going to get there. You have to make sure that every single milestone along the way does actually lead to the realization of the vision, because if it doesn't, then you're assuring yourself that you don't have a plan that's going to actually get you there. Any chess player would say, envision what checkmate's going to look like. And I have a game plan for how I'm going to get there. And that doesn't mean that they've decided every single move along the way, but they still have a general game plan of the kinds of things that are really important. Like I'm going to control the center of the board, or I'm going to take more pieces than my opponent and things like that. And that allows you to have a, a strategy that you believe in that's going to make it work. And I think that the same thing is, is really true within business, which is you have to kind of understand what those major milestones are. So for example, if you did want to disrupt an industry with AI or whatever, okay, great. You're going to use machine learning to solve a problem in a way that nobody else has actually done it before. Where are you going to get your data set from for your training data? Okay. Maybe you could build a product that's a freemium product that's going to allow you to capture the data that you need. And so it's not just a matter of like incrementally making strides towards the revenue goal that you're looking for. It's a matter of making the right kinds of like bets and making sure that you actually like accomplished this key milestone that's going to allow you to get to that next stage. And so a strategy would lay out what all those kinds of like stepping stones look like to get you there. And then you can pivot on that at the end, once you get to each of those milestones and decide, is this a strategy that we're going to continue with or not? So yeah. those are the three kind of like major things that are out there. I know I spoke for a long time about each of these. But I think that it's really important to understand the fundamental difference because a lot of companies have a strategy, but they're in pursuit of a vision that every single executive you asked would give you a different story as to what the vision is. Guess what? At some point, you're going to have a really fundamental disagreement on strategy. And it's not because you have a strategic disagreement. It's because you were never bought in in the first place to where the vision is that you're actually headed towards. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I think it made a lot of sense. And I, I really love that you use the term uh, stepping stones when you talk about strategy, because I think it takes the pressure off when people try to think about the exact path. Because there's that difference between a Google map that would tell you how to move through a grid like city, where it's go that way, then turn left and then turn right and keep going for a little while, which, you know what, we're charted, we're building into uncharted territory. We don't have those kinds of directions. What we have more or less is a, a bog or something like that, some <laughs> inconvenient territory in front of us, we have stepping stones, right? These stones are going to help us get to the other side, which is our vision, where we want to get to. And what you want to do is lay out these stepping stones. And sometimes the best path forward isn't necessarily straight on. It might be go this one and then this one and then step back to, and then go this way. And your job as a product manager, as a team really, is to figure out what the best step set of stepping stones are and in what order so that you're least likely to fall in or you're most likely to pick up the the most resource and everything along the way. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. Yeah, I think it's a really good way of uh, thinking about it. And uh, I love how you've broken down uh, mission, vision, and strategy there in a really clear way of thinking about it. Now, you've got a ton of experience and you've come from a, a background where you've had the, the luck of working with people who, like Marty Kagan, who uh, have set up really good companies and probably had this stuff in place. Have you had experience of coming into companies where they didn't have this and you've had to put it in place? I mean, how do you deal with that when a company oh, doesn't have it? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, I don't know that I can actually tell you a story where I walked into somewhere and all the things that were there. I mean, it's very rare. One of the reasons is really hard. I've had this personal experience, right? Of having been a, a full-time advisor for a period of about four and a half years between operational roles that I had taken on. And so I, during that time, I worked with about 50 different companies and I saw every, which version of it, good, bad, really ugly, you could name it. But a lot of companies that really had the right ideas and just didn't have the right kind of ways of putting it together. But the interesting part of this experience for me is I go write a book that sort of describes Here's how to think about these. Here's how to put it in place. And when I was advising and somebody was struggling to get some part of it done, they, they say things like, oh, I just haven't had the time. As an advisor from the outside, it's really easy for you to say, what do you mean? This is the thing you need to make the time for, blah, 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 blah. 
And now I go back to an operational role as the head of product at Woot, but I can tell you <laughs> sometimes the time is a real challenge and these things do take time. And even myself, I have to admit there's elements of this that I haven't even been able to put in place personally that I would have written about, <laughs> but it's, it's been you know, a challenge to kind of be find the, the time or the, or the capability to kind of put that together. So I think in a lot of ways, a lot of this is, is aspirational and you like figure out what components of that you can do and what are the most important parts for your company. But I'd say that the part that it is most commonly lacking is the vision part that's in the middle, which is kind of awkward, right? Because if you think of these as cascading, it seems weird that you'd have a mission and then you would have a strategy, but you wouldn't have a vision. And I, I do see that kind of thing happening a lot where there are major strategic milestones that companies might, might have. So for example, you might run into a consumer product company that says we're looking to, we, we know that we need to get more women on our platform and we're, we're too skewed in one direction versus another. And we feel like these are the three critical things that we need to deliver to make that happen, et cetera. But there's not a clarity as to, okay, to what end, right? Like you want to do that because you're trying to increase the size of your member base, or you're trying to diversify your, uh, your customer base to some degree, but what are you actually trying to accomplish at the end of the day? What's success going to look like when you get there from your customer's vantage point? And a lot of times it's just been so heavily weighted on the internal success metrics for a business. And so one of the things I talk about in Build What Matters is the separation of success outcomes by looking at it from a top-down perspective, purely from your customer's vantage point, and then also looking at it purely from your own vantage point as a business. And, and a good example of the separation of these two things is let's say you're doing B2B software. Your own success is gonna have at the very top, you're gonna say, hey, revenue is what, one of these big things that I'm driving towards. But from your customer's vantage point, as a B2B you know, customer, your revenue is their cost. So your numerator for success is their denominator for success. And by becoming more successful through raising your prices or having more products to sell and things like that's your success, but you've actually made your product. If you don't change your product to warrant that kind of increase in price and things like that, you actually made your own product worse for your customers. And now you're opening the door to a competitor or somebody else kind of like swooping in and taking away your business. So you have to first think about what is actually going to drive success for our customers and what do they care about? How can I deliver upon that? And then in doing that, how do I make sure that we have aligned incentives so that it makes sense for us to continue to, you know, kind of, you know, generate a really high profitable grow growth business, but at the same time as for accomplishing the, the milestones for our customers. And I think a good example of this would be what we try to do at Whoop. Whoop is a wearable device and we feel our mission statement is to help unlock human performance. And so where other wearables are more focused on telling you what you already did. We're trying to orient around telling you what to do next to help, you know, to help make you healthier, to help you become more fit, to help you optimize your performance. And one of the things that's fundamentally different about the way that Whoop operates is we don't sell device. If you buy a Garmin, you buy it. it's $500, $600, whatever for this watch. Now you have it. But there's a misincentive that's there between, you know, them, I think, and their customers, which is what incentive do they have to then work on the app and the software and things like that? What incentive do they have to proactively reach out to their customers through their, you know, own kind of like customer support to help resolve an issue that's out there? Like that's all just cost for them at the end of the day. And so what you see a lot of their innovative process and things like that going into is the building of the next watch, right? The addition of some next sensor and, and who knows whether it actually is meaningful or valuable or not, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to upsell you on yet another version of the product. And at Whoop, we kind of feel like that was a real disconnect between the, what was success for the customer and what was success for, for the business. And so we kind of tried to help flip the whole thing on its head. And we said, Hey, look, we're here to try to help you unlock your unit performance. We're here to give you coaching guidance and recommendations. So why don't we turn this instead into a subscription type model? You don't pay for the device at all, right? There's zero cost up front to pay for the device. You just buy a subscription and we'll send you the device because that's part of what's going to deliver the value proposition to you. But we're kind of putting our money where our mouth is to some extent, right? Because we have to resell the product to you. And in fact, every single month, it gets you to continue to, to choose to pay for it. And so now our incentives are very aligned with our customers' incentives, which is we want to build a better product. I want to create that next feature that you're going to interact with. Even if the AWS costs go up and things like that for us, that's fine because it makes it much more likely that you're going to retain as a customer. So their success and the value that they're continuing to get from the product is equ equal to our retention. And those two things are aligned. And that way we don't run into this problem where we're having to make these difficult decisions of do we invest in our customers or do we invest in ourselves? And I think that a lot of good product strategy is about making sure that you develop that alignment between yourself as a business and the customers that you're trying to serve at the end of the day. 
Right. Yeah. So this is an example of a well-developed product vision that helped uh, shape the decisions that went into the strategy and therefore into the pricing model for your product. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think that's really important is making sure that uh, I think that so many teams end up just dropping things into their strategy because they've seen it elsewhere, or because it feels like the right thing to do, or because they read it on a Medium article, or because uh, a lot of customers asked for it or whatever else. There's a lot of different ways to to drive decisions in businesses. And you touched on this earlier, actually. You touched on th this idea of teams who might be driven by science and data or um, over-experimentation or by... Uh, particular drivers and it's gone a little bit too far. It's taken away the art of uh, product management. And some of that is actually driven back to our uh, product vision, right? It's about understanding what it is that we're fundamentally trying to do and then weighing up the different pieces to make the best decisions. And that does mean balancing out. If this is where we need to go. These are the steps we can take. And these are the different drivers that we have. And it means not necessarily being driven by one particular thing, one particular aspect, which often ends up driving teams in the wrong direction. Yeah. Either one particular thing or too many things. I think that kind of thing happens as well. We in product find ourselves at the hub of a hub and spoke model where there are all these other different kinds of like functions in the organization, right? Marketing and sales and engineering and executives and operations and, you know, membership services and the list goes on. And what, what can happen is this bold vision that we talked about gets diluted because if you fall into the trap of trying to please everybody and make everybody happy, which is one of the other dysfunctions called the negotiating table, right. um, it, it, it drives you to say, I'm trying to effectively make everybody the least angry with what we can't do. <laughs> and that's not necessarily the best strategy for actually delivering something that's really meaningful and valuable to your customers. In order to be able to do that, you probably make somebody in the company really angry because you're going to have to say no to something really significant. And it could be an interesting opportunity, but it's going to be dilutive at the same time. And I think it's really important that in product management, you set the stage for what it is that you're trying to solve. And once you say, this is the vision, like this is where we're going and you get agreement and, and people rallying on that. And then subsequently you say, okay, now that we agree on the vision or, or at least we're going to disagree and commit once we're committed to that vision. Now we can talk about the strategy and we can commit to that strategy. And as you, if you take these key moments throughout the process and you say, let's just make sure that we're in agreement at this stage before we move on to the next stage, then what happens is you don't get into those arguments about the roadmap. And we've all had this experience where you present the roadmap as something you're really proud of. It's not perfect though. And then you put it out there and everybody is just, or where's my special feature that I wanted, or how come this thing's going to take so long? And it's everybody's equally mildly disappointed with what's out there. And that's like a, an, an indication that you like focus too much on trying to please stakeholders as opposed to getting stakeholders to buy into the direction that you're going to go and say, this is the best plan for how we're actually going to get there. This is the best mechanism. And that may mean that this department has to make a big sacrifice. There's a lot of automation that we could have done that would have helped you, but I got to get this stuff done. And you guys can agree that this is what we should do. So that's what we're going to go do. And it's amazing how many of those roadmap arguments just disappear once you actually have agreement on what the strategy is and agreement on what the vision is. Because then the roadmap almost kind of like, it kind of puts itself out there. It's not like a lot of hard work to say, you know, why this feature is going to come before that one. It's because we're trying to hit this milestone in the strategy before we get to that milestone in the strategy. And that's why we're going to have our, our real heavy emphasis in this one particular direction that can be really beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I want to hear from people in the chat. I mean, who here hates presenting the roadmap? Who gets anxiety, palpitations <laughs> when it comes to putting your roadmap out there? And who loves it? Is there anybody here who absolutely loves the chance to present it out there? One piece of advice I have for people who are presenting your roadmap is to not think about your roadmap as this perfect plan but actually think about it as a product. So when you're a designer, when you're designing something, you don't just take your thing from your head and make this perfect design that you assume is going to be perfect and it's going to go forward with no changes. You put it on paper and it, it's a bit junk, but you expect it to be junk and you're going to get feedback. And that's okay because you're used to taking on feedback and you learn from it and you iterate. Your first version of your roadmap is going to suck. The whole pro point of it is that you're going to take the assumptions that you have and the assumptions that you've learned from other pieces, all the input that you have, and you put it down on paper or in some sort of form and you share it with other people and they're going to give you feedback on it. But based on that feedback, you can improve your roadmap. You can improve your strategy. So your strategy goes from being a flimsy version of that strategy 
to a much more robust version of that strategy. Rather than being afraid of sharing your roadmap, it's more about embracing the, the feedback and the collaborative nature that roadmapping can actually um, bring forward. I always say it's less about the roadmap itself and more about the roadmapping process. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's a great quote from Dwight Eisenhower, which is plans are worthless. Planning is everything. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love that because I just think about it. trying to orchestrate World War II. You know, it's a pretty big, challenging exercise. And but uh, that whole idea of yeah, your plan is going to have to get you know out the door. Like things are going to change so fast on you. But the process of actually planning is you're not going to win unless you've actually gone through that. And I think that really applies in spades to product management. Yeah, and that's one of the best things that a good product person can do, a good product leader can do, is guide their team through that road mapping process. It can be painful to begin with, but the more that you get it out there, the more feedback that you get on it, the more that you share this stuff with your team, the more that your assumptions get checked, and the, the better you become on this. And uh, we're seeing some like some comments from people in the uh, the chat now. Brent says it's uh, a lot about managing expectations. Uh, which I think I, I agree with. Yeah. And Peter saying that he often provides pictures about the direction because it helps people get, imagine the direction so that they can get more helpful feedback. So yeah, really good input. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat or the Q&A and uh, we'll be picking those up. Now, we're also talking about scaling today, this idea of hyperscaling, growing your team. I know you've been through companies that have done this. Does the vision change as the company scales? What changes? The mission, the vision, the strategy? What breaks first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think that it's a little bit of a spectrum. Hopefully mission doesn't change ever, right? If mission has changed, you've almost like kind of sold one company and founded another one to some extent. Like that's what defines the company in the first place. So hopefully that's not really changing. I think vision can change and, and should change from time to time, but it's rarely the case. And I think it's either an artifact of you're getting too close to realizing your vision such that it's no longer bold, right? Like effectively, like that's what happens. You get close enough to hitting it that you're thinking, like, this isn't really challenging us enough. And I think this happens when companies hit product market fit, right? Like a lot of times the vision that they were looking for is the product market fit that they're now experiencing, which is great. But then what happens is naturally you start to say, well, how can we broaden our market um, so that we can continue to grow broader than what we'd be able to do? How do we increase TAM? And as you start to look at those kinds of questions, suddenly you start to realize that it paints a broader picture for what your vision could potentially be. I'm sure that the vision for Facebook or what Meta or whatever now is very different than it was at the time that the company was originally founded. And that's because they hit success along the way. And then there are other companies, I think, that where they have to make a very hard pivot. And that's the place where you also you know, change your vision. You're saying, look, we're just not getting traction on this. I don't see that to success. Maybe there's a vision for which there is no strategy that's actually going to be successful. And if you can't declare what the strategy is going to be, and you can't even think of any way in which you can achieve that, then it's probably an indication that you're thinking, maybe you're thinking too broadly about what, what, what your vision could be. And so that's another kind of time to, to change that. Strategy, on the other hand, I think should can and should change on a regular basis. It's, just, it's the difference between using Google Maps to navigate because we plugged it in a day ago and it told us this is the turn-by-turn turn directions versus using Waze. And hey, given traffic and where we're running into issues now, we're going to have to like maneuver or hey, I missed that turn. What do I do next? And I think that that's the kind of thing that the, like an active kind of like navigation would do for you. And I think that always thinking about your strategy in that way is something that's a very beneficial thing to do. And I think that there are natural points at which you should do that, which is that every time you get to a new milestone, it's like you have this path and, and you're at a mountaintop and that gives you visibility in a way that you didn't really have before, because now you've kind of like reached this new pinnacle. And at that point you can, okay, let me look and, and see the lay of the land. And like you described, you're going through a bog here and you're like, Ooh, <laughs> that's a treacherous path over there. Now that I see it, uh, I thought that we were going to go there, but now that I'm here, I kind of realized that maybe that's not the path anymore. Let me lay out a better path. And I think there are natural points at which you should intend to do that. Maybe it's the next stage at which you raise funds. Maybe it's the next stage at which you land a, a marquee customer. Those are kinds of just like things they can make a really big difference for you. So I see that, that those are the times at which things should, should change. And scaling to me is like almost like an independent axis of that, which is you scale as the situation demands that you scale. That can sometimes be the next milestone in a strategy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And actually this kind of links in with Javier's question. He just asked, uh, how often should the, prior, should the priority of the roadmap be reviewed? each quarter or something else? Well, I think it depends on the stage of the company to some extent. Uh, I've seen companies where, you know, I, I once had advised a, a company that was like effectively a utility and they, I'm not exaggerating. This utility had a 50 year plan 
Okay. So reviewing things on a quarterly basis might be a little bit too frequent actually for them. And then I've also worked with startups that's three people in a garage. And if you said, hey, we're going to review this quarterly, what are you talking about? Quarter is an eternity for them. So I think that obviously it kind of depends on, on the stage of the company. But I would say for most companies, if you have, let's say a three to five year term vision, you might have strategic milestones that are every six to 12 months that are like major kind of things that you need to hit along the way. And so what I've tried to use is like the rule of like thirds of quarters, which is if you take your vision length, maybe divide that into like quarters or so, or like a quarter of the length of time. So if you have a four-year vision, then maybe you have one year long milestones that are kind of like worthy. If you have a, if you have a 20 step plan to success, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. If you have a one step plan to success, you're probably not thinking, you know, in enough detail about what you need to do to make that happen. So maybe you cut it into four different chunks about major milestones that you need to hit. And then I think about those as being like, those are the drivers of the roadmap. So I might have a one-year roadmap in that case. And then the frequency at which I want to update it is not every one year, because that means that let's say I, I updated every January 1st. Well, on December 15th, I don't have a whole lot of visibility into where I'm actually headed. And it's like driving into a fog that, where the fog gets thicker and thicker. And so you don't really want to do that. So I like, again, dividing it into quarters. And naturally you get to the situation where you got a one-year roadmap you're updating on a quarterly basis. But if you only have a three month roadmap, then I'd recommend updating on maybe a monthly basis. That's kind of a, a general rule of thumb that I've found to work pretty well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And this is where things like the now, next, later roadmap come into their strength as well. Simon and uh, Brent are just talking about, Simon is talking about the now, next, later roadmap in the chat. But one of the things that you can do with the now, next, later roadmap is think about the now column as things you update in every day or every week sort of thing. The the next column is stuff that you think about every week or a uh, couple months. And the later column becomes months and sometimes years because you're thinking that much further ahead. But the beauty of it is that the horizon changes. So you're not tying yourself to an arbitrary one year thing, which is somehow how most roadmaps are set. Yeah. You think at one year and no more, no less, which is myopic for some and too long for other companies. But it means that, it, that the length of it stretches depending on how mature your product is and how far out you're able to see. Yeah, that's right. Or, or how likely you think things are to change between now and then as well. One of the things that I did when I was at Opower that I think was an interesting exercise is I hired somebody in product operations. And one of the key questions that I had is how good are we at predicting what it is that we're going to actually deliver? And so we went through this exercise and we had a one-year roadmap. We updated it on a quarterly basis. And what I had him do is, is I had him look back every quarter at saying, okay, there's been four different times that we've predicted what we were going to deliver in Q4 of this year. We had it in Q3, we had a prediction for Q4. In Q2, we had a prediction for Q4. In Q1, we had a prediction for Q4. How did those predictions like change over time? And then what did we end up actually delivering? And one of the things that was really interesting is we learned through that exercise that we were very good at predicting what we were going to do in a six month time frame, And we were horrendous at predicting what we were going to do beyond that. And why don't we just call a spade at that point and decide that a six month roadmap is actually a better length of time than a one year roadmap. All we're doing is making a bunch of, we always say a false precision for the business. It, it never, the roadmap was never a commitment. I think it, it's an, it's a more agile kind of thing as you were describing, but something that's more of a prototype. But at the same time, if I'm only going to deliver 20% of the things that I say I'm going to deliver, cause I'm going to change my mind three times between now and then. Why even put it on paper in the first place? Who, who is this benefiting at the end of the day? And we realized we were spending a lot of time on that to very little benefit and shorten the roadmap. And I think that that's a quick kind of exercise that just about any company can do is to look back at those roadmaps and look at what they actually delivered and say, let's make an honest assessment about our ability to predict and whether this is actually beneficial or not. That's actually really smart, taking a look back on your roadmaps. I don't think many companies do that. I think a lot of people look at their past roadmaps and go, ooh, that's a whole list of things I didn't do. But there's so much <laughs> learning you can get out of that. Yeah. You know, you know, having. It, 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 I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But. I was going to say, having a list of things that you've learned, things that you did do, things that you didn't do, and why, right? What were the outcomes along the way as well? Yeah, we do sprint level retrospectives, but do we do roadmap level retrospectives? That's effectively what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. In ProdPad, we have a what we call the completed column. So once you actually finish a, a roadmap level item, you move it to a new section of the roadmap, and it keeps this almost reverse timeline of things that you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. But you know, so many teams don't have this as a, as an option The the roadmap always looks forward. It never looks back. Uh, and I like the, the concept as you say, like a, a roadmap level retrospective, always be retroing, never skip the retros because you can learn so much from them. <laughs> For sure. Uh, there were a couple of questions that have uh, come in. We had one in here. Uh, somebody asked a question about what are your thoughts on the best way to move from product management to product strategy? 
This will be met with some criticism, I'll say, my answer. But I think that the best answer, and I think that this actually can be done, even though there is a lot of people who think that it can't, is you just start doing it. Yeah, I'll tell you as a product leader myself, the people who I'm most inclined to promote, the people who I'm most impressed by their work is not the people who do their current job today best. That's why I want to keep them doing what they're saying, to be honest, right? Like, I almost don't want to promote you if you're too good at what you do. It's the people who are like showing what they're capable of at that next level. And when somebody says, let me not just show you a roadmap for what it is that I want to do within my own team. Here are the problems that I'm trying to solve. Here's the customer research that I've done. Here are the things that I want to build. Here's kind of like the rough timeline for when I think I can get these things done and so on. And then actually executes it. I also want somebody who can say, but I have some constraints on what I'm able to do. And part of those constraints are defined by this and this. Here are some things that I think we could also do to release some of those constraints. And here's what I see as the potential for the kinds of things that I'm working on. And if we thought more broadly about this, then I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, et cetera. Let me show you what's possible. And let me show you what the ROI for those kinds of things might be. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's how you like you get promoted. And so a lot of people feel like it goes in the opposite direction. It's almost like you have to get promoted first in order to be given product strategy. And I think this product strategy is something you take by the horns. So it's really interesting. My, my own experience of writing the book, you know, I had actually written it with the intent of focusing on product leaders. And the more that I've spoken to people about it, the more I've talked to them about it, the more I've actually recognized myself that it's really valuable, not just for the product leaders, but for the individual contributors who want to step more and more in that direction. There's nothing that can't be applied still at a sort of like lower you know, level within the organization. You don't have to only strategize at the top level and then make everything fit. If you're missing strategy at the top level, start building it yourself. And then you'll find that you have the opportunity to just keep building it and building it and building it. And if you're at a company that doesn't respect, that doesn't appreciate, that shoots that down, maybe you're at the wrong company. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, this is something that I've shared with people as well is when you're an individual contributor, when you're in a more junior role, I think a lot of people assume that management level has got it. Like they somehow know what they're doing. They don't always have it. And sometimes you start seeing these cre these cracks in the strategy, but you don't quite know how to articulate it yet. You don't have that experience yet. But sometimes your first steps into it are asking the tough questions and, you know, poking around and saying, if, our, if you say that our vision is this, but you're taking these steps, I don't see how that ties up. Like you're allowed to ask those questions and worst Kate, they tell you off and you realize that you're in a bad place. It's not a great company. If you're getting in trouble for asking questions about what the company strategy is, best case, maybe they tell you that there is a great strategy and they, they loop you in on it and you've now learned something. Even possibly better case, you identify a problem and you help the company overcome it and you could get promoted to help solve that problem. That's how a lot of people move up into these management roles is by being per a person in the team who not just spots problems, but helps to solve the problems and takes away problems from the management team. That's how you can become a manager yourself. Essentially, that's how you can move into strategy is by um, identifying problems with it and helping to fix them. Really. I remember a boss said to me when I was a junior product manager, he said, I like the way you call bullshit when you see it. And yeah, it's stuff like that, that it helps to ask the questions because you never know what kind of things are going on above you. And chances are, if uh, you think that you've got input into the strategy, it is valuable. It's worth hearing your voice on it. There was a great question in the uh, chat from Peter. He said, product people always agree with what you're saying, that we can't predict beyond X months. But to what degree are we being lazy? Like, why not? Why don't we try to be more accurate to meet whatever deadline for a certain, a certain market point in time beyond six months? I think it's a fair question. You don't just say, well, we're not good at this and therefore we shouldn't do it. Sometimes you have to get good at the things you're not currently good at. But I guess I would just ask the question, why do you need to get further ahead? A lot of people think you need to have a one-year roadmap because I don't know, everybody else has a one-year roadmap. But if it's not actually serving any good because it's giving, like I said, false precision about what's actually going to get delivered, then, you know, there's a problem there. And I think that you could solve that problem one of two ways. You can either get better at doing it, which will take a lot of work, a lot of time and a lot of patience, and will also carry some negative consequences that I'll, that I'll cover in a sec. The other approach is that you could just, we don't actually need that. It's not actually benefiting us in, in some specific way. Now, to go back to this example, because this was from when I was at Opower, we were selling a B2B software solution to utilities, to, to power companies. And it, when they're looking to buy a SaaS solution, a lot of times they wanted to know that we were the right long-term part. And long-term to them didn't even mean a year. <laughs> it meant 10 years. And so they wanted us to know that we were the right partner for that. And so they wanted to know, where are you going with your product? And, and what I would do is there is I would say is there's a ways of solving what you need to deliver without necessarily 
putting it all into the roadmap. And I think a lot of teams think, oh, that means I've got to have a Gantt chart that explains exactly what's going to get delivered when. And I don't know that's actually true. What they wanted to know is that we were the right partner. And that means telling them about the future direction for where we're going. What they actually wanted to know was our vision. And they didn't need to know this feature was going to get delivered on exactly X, Y, Z date. What they needed to know is that we were intending to solve not just an energy efficiency problem for them, but that we were also really married to the idea of solving a customer engagement problem for them as well. Or that as they wanted to digitize, that we were going to be their partner to help them in this digital transformation. And so we could talk about the things that we intended to work on. We could talk about the relative kind of approximate timing, like we're going to do this first and the second and this third, and this is what our company looks like, and this is why, et cetera. But hopefully doing so without making a bunch of external commitments in our roadmap that would, would tie our hands. And that comes back to what that negative consequence actually is, which is on the one hand, we talk a big game about being agile and nimble and changing based on the information that we're seeing in the market. And on the other hand, we want these long-term roadmaps that are going to tell us exactly the future of where we're going to be headed. And it's kind of like, you can't have both to some extent, right? If you want to know exactly every turn that you're going to take on your, your driving directions and every single step along the way, then you, you don't get to be dynamic about it anymore. You're going to see a road close line and you're just going to be like stuck there, not knowing what to do. And I think that the reality is in product management, it's a balancing act between these two. And so the key is just drawing it at the right place. Now, if there's a reason at the company that you need to have that kind of like, you know, visibility, then yeah, maybe you are being lazy and you need to find a way to get through that. For example, we, at, at Whoop, we have a hardware and a software component to our business. And hardware timelines are just radically different than software timelines, so especially in today's world where you got to order parts <laughs> and chips and things like that a whole year in advance because the backlog of supply chain is just so broken right now. Imagine what it's like. I imagine what it's like to be at Apple. They don't make decisions. They're not like, hey, we just shipped the iPhone 13. I guess we should start thinking about what's going to be an iPhone 14 now. They've been thinking about this for years because it's a years long process to get it done. And they're thinking about what features and software capabilities and things like that need to, you know, be marketable so that, you know, somebody can go up and stand on stage and really tell this compelling story about what's going to, you know, make it an exciting product to go by. And if they don't think about that years in advance, they're going to fail and it's not going to be all that exciting. So they're kind of like required to do this and it would be lazy if they didn't do that. But I think it's just a matter of provide as much visibility as you need, but no more than what you need, because all it really does is tie your hands and sink a bunch of time, especially if you consider you're going to update the, if, you're, if you have a one-year roadmap and you're going to update it every quarter, what if it was a nine-month roadmap and you updated it every quarter? Like you're not working on the three quarters from now stuff today, and you're going to update it between now and then anyway. So unless the visibility itself is inherently valuable, it's actually kind of a little bit of a wasted effort, right? And it depends on the company. It depends on how marketing goes. It depends on what kinds of promises you may need to make to clients, depending on the nature of the business or B2B enterprise deals and things like that. But do what you have to do, but but try to minimize it, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And Peter did uh, clarify. He said, uh, hardware is the example. So you're a great person to speak to this. And I think it is an important thing to talk about. One of the I think you really hit the nail on the head with this. Something to add to that is remember that this planning work isn't free. Right. Somebody has to put the work in to do the estimations, the project work. Like you can plan this stuff way ahead of time, but it takes effort and money essentially of the company. And so the, t the team has to invest in this and you could end up making decisions that you can't reverse out of, which is expensive for the company, but you're actually literally spending time that you can't get back that you could spend on learning what you should be building next week and iterating on that. And this is one of the key things where software differs from hardware or some of these, if you're in health tech or fintech or highly regulated spaces. So yeah, if you're in hardware or in a regulated space, sometimes you do have to plan out. It is more expensive. This is why it's more expensive and harder to work in hardware or in regulated industries because you have to put in the hard work to plan ahead in these ways. Whereas software companies, I mean, hey, we can iterate tomorrow if we wanted to, we have that freedom. But if you're working in hardware and you put that work in, you're much more defensible. I mean, you could, somebody couldn't just go and make an Apple device tomorrow. Like it takes effort and time. Somebody couldn't just go replicate what Whoop does tomorrow because they would have to think about it years in advance. Whereas it's a lot easier to replicate a, a software app. It's less defensible. But it's about balancing out the time versus effort. And there's a certain point at a cutoff where you say, it's not worth us planning that far out. What are we trying to achieve here? Who are we trying to please? I think we have time for maybe one last question. If we have a quick fire one, do you have any tips for growing product teams to scale with the product? Let's see, tips for growing product teams to scale with the product. Yeah, there's a couple of things I think as a hiring manager, one tip is 
always, you're always recruiting. You're always hiring people and you're going to meet people out there and go get lunches with people and things like that. Do it when you're not recruiting, do it when you're not hiring for an open role, because then when you open the role, you've already got the relationship. You can reach out and say, Hey, I really love that conversation that we had. I'd really you know, like you to apply for this role. I think you'd be great here. And it's just so much better to find talent that way than it would be if you were starting cold every time. It's always amazing to me how willing to start cold we are in that. And the reality is like, Sales teams do this kind of stuff all the time. Recruiting is sales. And if you're a salesperson would never say, okay, well, I'm just going to wait until I see an RFP <laughs> and then I'll respond to it. You're out there built, cultivating relationships and building those things and hopefully you establish your own network and, and that can take you really far. So I definitely encourage people to do that. And then, and then the last one that I'd say is in, in recruiting, there's a little, especially today, there's, it's a, it's an employee's market, right? It's really difficult to find good talent right now because they have tons of job opportunities and you're usually competing against many different kinds of companies and things like that. So I'm going to come back to the vision, which is a great product person will be inspired, not by 5,000 extra dollars on their offer. They'll be inspired by the vision for what they're going to be working towards, what they're going to be building. And if that doesn't inspire them, you're probably the wrong hire in the first place. But if that's the kind of thing that, that allows you to win, go invest the time to go develop that vision, not just for yourselves internally, but go develop that for the sake of actually having something to, to share. And what I've done a lot of times is at the same moment as I'm giving an offer to somebody, I'm like, hey, here's the package. Here's why we're really excited about you. Here's what we loved in the interviews. And I just wanted to take half an hour to walk you through the vision of where we're going to head and the kinds of amazing things that you're going to be contributing to here. Um, no one else does this. It's amazing. They kind of give the offer and it's like, okay, as it was always about the dollars and cents. And I don't think for product people, it, it, it rarely actually is primarily about that. We want to work at these amazing companies doing amazing things for customers. And I think if you can really tell that story so that they can then go explain to their spouse or whoever, like why they're so excited to take this on. It's just amazing what kind of benefit that does. And it's one of the best half hours you'll ever spend. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great tips. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's a good time to wrap up. So I want to say thank you so much, Ben, for joining us and for sharing your advice and tips and experience with us today. For everybody who's joined, thank you so much for joining and joining in on the chat and dropping your questions in and all that. Today has been recorded, so uh, you will get a copy of this, but you can also uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel and uh, uh, subscribe there and you'll see it uh, pop up in the next week or so. Uh, the transcript will be available uh, on our site as well uh, shortly. And listen to my voice. Our next webinar is planned. It's in the calendar. Uh, we are going to get it up on the site soon. Uh, it's going to be around the topic of OKRs and measuring success. And we've lined up Bruce McCarthy, uh, the author of Product Roadmap Relaunched, to come join us. It's going to be on Thursday, January 20th. So for those of you listening, pop that in your calendars now, and you'll see the invites coming out shortly. It's going to be in the same time, same place, uh, Thursday, January 20th. So see you all there. And in the meantime, Ben, thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you everybody for joining us here today. Everybody have a great afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are, and talk to you all again in the new year. And thanks so much for having me. Really, I appreciate being here. And I know Bruce, he's great. I think you'll have a great conversation with Ben uh, in January. So looking forward to bringing that. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, we'll see you back here then. Take care. Take Bye. Care. Bye. <laughs>